So as we alluded to um, a little earlier, the process of developing a, a, a substance or behavioral use disorder, um, the, the use of the substance um, to maintain the same set point, that, to get the same effect out of it, over time we end up having to utilize more. And the reason being is that initially we have the receptors and we provide substance or drug and we're binding to those available receptors. Well over time what happens is is that we now are having an, an increased number of receptors that are being produced or are available. So the same amount of drug binds to the same number of receptors, but not nearly enough so to excite the same number of neurons to have the same amount of release of dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine. So over time, more drug is needed to activate the more receptors that are available to get to the same end event. So, additionally, the properties of the drug, the reinforcing properties of the drug are decreased over time. So the same amount of drug that you took in the beginning will not potentially have the same amount of effect as you move forward as you've developed some, some tolerance. Why? Because of the amount of drug that it takes to get to the same response is not the same over time. It, it takes more over time. And so the need then for more drug to maintain the new set point is where we become dependent. So we reset that set point so not only does it take more drug to get where we want to get, the need for more drug means that we're now more dependent as we've developed that tolerance. So, this teeter-totter is really important to remember, especially in the development of substance use disorders, the younger and younger folks. However, it still has the same interaction. The behaviors that activate the reward pathway or the substances that activate that, that pathway become dominant and will override your better part of your brain that's saying, yeah, we probably shouldn't do that. So maybe in the beginning, when you rolled your first roller coaster, you were really anxious and maybe even fearful and thought, ah, I don't want to do this. Well, the 5,000th time you've ridden a roller coaster, guess what? Your brain may not have the same type of fear response. So although that's still a very dangerous activity and it could still potentially harm or kill you, and the prefrontal cortex is saying, probably not the greatest idea, Your amygdala has said, eh, I didn't get hurt before. And your, your hippocampus has said, well, I've got memories of this was kind of fun. And I know that when I activate this pleasure center, I get this euphoria. And so we're going to tip the teeter-totter to where we're going to override the better making decision part of your brain. And this was what happens not only in in addictive behaviors, whether it be gambling issues or whether it be substance use issues, that the reward pathway can outweigh the decision-making part of your brain. So <clears throat> in theory, that's good, but what does it look like if we actually put science to it? So over time, if we look at prolonged substance use, what happens with 
PET and SPEC scanning, and we look at glucose metabolism and, and activity in different areas of the brain, what happens in our decision-making part of our brain? Kind of shuts down a little bit. So we know over time that although theoretically it makes sense that the pleasure pathway is sort of going to override our better judgment-making parts of our brain, neuroimaging actually proves that that's true. Methamphetamine, just another example. So if we look at the neuroimaging changes, so in, a, in the regular brain, in the regular brain, the normal brain, the control brain, we're looking at, at dopamine transporter activity. And so this is dopamine reuptake and, and, and reuptake. Um, and so methamphetamine working sort of similarly like cocaine with the, the interaction with reuptake. But what happens over time? The brain kind of says, eh, why? We've had a receptor down regulation. We now, the brain is saying, man, I got to get more places involved and you better give me more so that I can get back to the same place that I was at. Yes? I'm a little, I'm confused. I think, are we down right down regulating or up regulating the receptors? You're down regulating. Down. So and all up regulating? You're down regulating the receptor. So earlier we talked about up regulating. So <laughs> when was that? So when when you when you show the when you show the receptors the same number of receptors over and over and over, you're going to get an increase in production, but they're down regulated. So your your those receptors now, although are hypersensitive, okay. So if we've down regulated them, they are wanting to be activated and they're more irritable. Make sense? Up, receptor up and down regulation is not an easy concept. Let's just put it that way. So don't get hung up on trying to really tease apart receptor up and down regulation because that's a, it's a difficult neurophysiological concept to try to say how do we correlate that to behavior. So we mentioned genetics earlier and so we know that Genetic propensity for substance abuse disorders is, is a real thing. So there's a fourfold increased risk in first degree relatives. So mom or dad has an alcohol use disorder, it's a four times greater risk probability that you're going to have that. Now, we know that that genetics is potentially sometimes just as strong or stronger than the environment because you can separate children and there's even twin studies that have been done. And there's still the genetics are there to open up Pandora's box. Monkeys. Are they still doing primate research at OMRF or at uh, they used to have the primate. I came from there. Are they still doing primate research? No, unfortunately they're having to do the baboon work in the Anderson or actually out of the country. Okay. I thought at one point they were shutting it down. But. They, they did. There, there were some issues, <laughs> some ethical issues in, in a, with research projects and the way things were monitored and handled. Yeah. And so they have just... Completely shut it down. Or shut it down, basically. It was a, it was a, PR, it was a PR hit to OU, which basically what it comes down to, so they gradually face it out. Right, okay. So this was um, this was a primate study, and it's it's actually kind of interesting. So they looked at, uh, if you look at, at primate family groups, um, 
there are, are going to be dominant individual primates in those family groups. You see it in, in, all, in all animal groups. You look at dogs, you know, there's going to be an alpha. You, you look with us, you're going to end up having dominant and, and subordinate um, individuals. Well, what they did is they looked at dominant and subordinate primates in a, in, a, in a family group and they individually housed them and then they socially housed them with their group and they looked at how their brains responded to this and then they extrapolated why this might put someone or some types of individuals at greater risk for addiction or addiction responses. And so if we look at this box right here, you have your, your dominant rank primate in a social family situation or in a social group situation with other primates and you're looking at their dopamine receptor density and activity and now I want you to look at your subordinate dopamine receptor density and activity so this group right here when they allowed them to self-administer drug this group was much more apt to develop a cocaine misuse. Theoretically because there's less dopaminergic activity and so we're using that cocaine to try to increase that dopaminergic activity. But do any of us like being subordinate? Or do we want to be dominant? So the little dude at the bar drinks a bunch of beer and now thinks he's 10 foot tall and bulletproof. <laughs> That's this one right here. Okay, so we lose some inhibition. And so these folks right here are at a greater risk of developing misuse disorders and then acting upon those in a social group. So it was a very interesting, very interesting study, very well done study, very expensive study, but very well done study. So addiction, the younger the brain, the greater the probability. So if we look at substances of abuse as well as alcohol, our, our little bell curve here, so early teens through late 20s is where we're going to see those folks if they're going to develop a substance use disorder this is the the highest density from an age group perspective why is this and why oftentimes do you see more males in this brain development, brain development. it's about your prefrontal cortex okay so again i mentioned earlier the sort of non-real medical terms at the back of the brain matures first and the frontal cortex develops a little later. And so adolescents, teens, kids are at greater risk of poor judgment, poor planning. They engage in more risky behaviors. And so although that reward pathway in the adult will override the prefrontal cortex, it will really override the prefrontal cortex in an immature prefrontal cortex. So because we know that this process, this pathway, can override even the mature prefrontal cortex, in the immature brain, the imbalance is such that these are folks are at much greater risk of high risk behaviors, engaging in things that would give high reward, um, and they don't really think before they act. And so this is sort of the science behind why it is that the younger brain is more apt to develop substance use disorders.
And then if we add this thing right here, if we add the stress response, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical access, and all of this. So that stress response activates this guy right here, right? So we know that whole HPA access has a big impact on amygdala. So you add a stressful environment, whether it be at home or the bullying aspects at school or every kid now alive has a device in their hand and social media doesn't ever let them get away from anything. So it's always this person talking about that person who talked about me, who had this on, who needs to go buy this at the store, who was really ugly, who was really good looking, and now I don't like myself. And so we put all of that on top of the pathway that's already super sensitive to override this. And it just allows the greater propensity for drug and alcohol misuse. So treatment of addiction. This isn't going to be all inclusive by any means. Primary method of treatment for addiction has got to be non-pharmacologic. It's got to be counseling. All Every study under the sun is going to show you if you do pharmacologic treatment alone, you are setting yourself up to fail. They have got to be in some sort of counseling and therapy paired with the appropriate pharmacological treatment if it's appropriate but they've got to be in some sort of counseling so if we look at just a few things that can be utilized to aid us in medication assisted treatment so we can use naltrexone um, for alcohol, uh, so it's basically blocking the opioid receptor. It'll put someone into opioid withdrawal if you give it to them and they're on opioids. Um, disulfram, it's not really used anymore, but you can get a disulfram reaction if you have somebody. It used to be that they tried to force patients in alcohol rehab to take disulfram. And so then if they drank alcohol or a substance that contained alcohol, they would get violently ill. The problem is, is that there are certain things in our diets that can contain uh, an appreciable amount of alcohol. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're ingesting alcohol. So we, you would have people that were getting sick after eating, you know, fermented things or red wine vinegar with their, you know, bread dipped at the, the local Italian restaurant and they get violently ill. So disulfram is not really used a lot plus unless a patient is ultra motivated do you think you're going to get somebody that's forced into alcohol re rehab to take a pill every day that's going to make them really sick just to say who this is going to keep me from drinking no I'm just going to not take the pill and I'm going to drink so not really an effective thing um, a medicine that came out probably 10 12 years ago it went under the trade name of Camprol, but the generic is acamprosate. Um, this aids in um, alcohol recovery. So here's our friend glutamate. So we talked about gabaglycine as inhibitory, glutamate as an activating uh, uh, substance. So acamprosate inhibits the release of glutamate with activity on uh, that, that also has some feedback with GABA uh, because alcohol is a GABA drug. But we're attempting to pro prohibit withdrawal. Now, the use of acamprosate, and all of the studies showed if you just used it alone, you weren't going to get somebody to quit drinking. It was that combined with some sort of, of counseling or therapy in a 12 step program or an alcohol anonymous program or some other counseling therapy program that allowed them to reduce their craving or desire for alcohol while you were helping them move through why it is they turn to the substance and how it is we're going to reduce the behaviors that lead us to want to use the substance. Uh, heroin, we can throw opioids in here as well. Initially, methadone was sort of the treatment of choice with opioid um, and heroin addiction for medication-assisted treatment. This has been 
moved away uh, somewhat. Methadone, a very interesting medicine. Um, methadone works through the NMDA receptor, not the opioid um, uh, side of the world, although it does have some opioid activity. Each dose of methadone uh, stays in your body for about three days. And so one of the desirable things about methadone for a methadone treatment clinic was is that you could go, you could drink your liquid methadone first thing in the morning because it had a 36 hour half life you were fine to not have to go back to the methadone clinic until the next day. The problem being is that what was found out over time is methadone is just as abusable and misusable as opiates can be, but at times far more dangerous. Methadone prolongs the QT interval, so we're at greater risk of QT prolongation in torsades. Methadone is a profoundly, uh, profoundly suppresses the respiratory drive at the reticular activating system. So, Anna Nicole Smith, she died of methadone overdose. Why? She was used to utilizing typical opioids. And so when she took methadone, this is the theory, or at least what was told by those who were in her presence when this was happening. She took methadone and wasn't getting the same opioid relief that she was used to with a short acting or immediate release opioid like hydrocodone or oxycodone. So then she took more still not where we wanted to be so then we took more well by the time she started to get some sort of semblance of, of opioid relief we had built up a toxic level she just didn't wake up the next day because of the respiratory suppressant effect there have been multiple prominent um, uh, folks that have succumbed to this right here because a lot of them had opioid and substance use disorders they got on methadone they started misusing methadone and then they had respiratory suppression, just didn't wake up the next day. The more probably appropriately utilized heroin or opioid medication assisted treatment is buprenorphine. I'm a little displeased with the State Bureau of Narcotics at this point. Uh, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Narcotics has removed the um, milligram morphine equivalent calculation with buprenorphine now such that giving reckless disregard for prescribing of buprenorphine. Uh, as our state moved into the whole opioid crisis and we've got to find a way to get these people into treatment, under the Obama administration, and I'm trying not to be political, but under the Obama administration, there were lots of dollars set aside for addiction treatment. The states just had to give them statistics. The state of Oklahoma did a good job of giving a large statistic because that brought a lot of money into the state of Oklahoma. The more people that we can list as opioid addicted instead of dependent or tolerant or whatever, the more money that we got. Well, to deal with that, the state then said, we need to train as many people possible to get buprenorphine waivers on their DEA. So buprenorphine comes in a couple of different forms. Buprenorphine actually comes in a transmucosal and a transdermal that is approved for the treatment of pain. But it also has formulations that are oral dissolving and by tablet, Suboxone and Subutex, which are only approved by the FDA for the treatment of opioid or heroin addiction. The problem being is that buprenorphine is just as easily abused, misused, diverted, and has an opioid addiction property to it just as well. It is an opioid. But what our state has done is said, we are going to remove lots of restrictions because we want to use buprenorphine to treat opioid addiction in our state. You mark my word, within the next five to 10 years, this is going to be our next problem. I see it every day in our clinic with people that are misusing buprenorphine. It is not the end all be all, be very careful. But to prescribe buprenorphine for pain, you do not have to have any additional training. You can, you can prescribe Belbuca or Butrans for pain. It's a schedule three drug, um, and you don't have to have a waiver. But if you, pr if you prescribe buprenorphine for medication assisted treatment for opioid addiction, you have to go through the medication assisted treatment training program. PAs used to not be allowed 
you could go through it, but your DEA number would not signify that you actually had the ability to write buprenorphine for medication-assisted treatment. So it was, what, what, it was what, was, what was called an X on your DEA license. So you would have your number, and then it would be followed by an X, which meant you had been through buprenorphine waiver training and that you were, had the ability to prescribe buprenorphine for medication-assisted treatment. Emergency rules were put into place by our federal government, which now allow PAs and nurse practitioners to go through medication-assisted treatment training and get a buprenorphine waiver on their, their DEA license, which means that you can manage a number of opioid addiction patients and prescribe buprenorphine. The thing is, is that buprenorphine does have does calculate to milligram morphine equivalents. The state has now removed those and has basically said you can prescribe at whatever, you, whatever level you want to and, and we're not going to have concern of that. My concern is, as you look at the package insert of buprenorphine, it will prolong the QT interval. Transdermal buprenorphine has in their package insert a maximum dose of 20 microgram patch, which is 20 micrograms delivered per hour, changed once a week, and they do have information from their clinical trials showing prolongation of the QT interval. Well, right now, if we've removed those restrictions from the state saying you can prescribe how much ever it takes, what is the next issue that we have? It's abusable, but you just have to be careful if you choose to treat folks with buprenorphine. Tobacco, we have all of the nicotine patches, gums, lozenges, 1-800-QUIT-NOW, use that program, it's free, the state of Oklahoma for the um, the uh, tobacco settlement allowed for 1-800-QUIT-NOW to provide free patches, gum, lozenges for 30 days and those that are in a smoking cessation program. That program is not just patches, lozenges, or gum, they're also giving a quit smoking coach and, and some smoking cessation counseling. One thing that's not up here is, um, by golly, it just skipped my brain. Um, Chantix. So Chantix is uh, the oral systemic medication to help reduce nicotine craving. The big thing with Chantix is be very careful in utilizing it with somebody that has a history of psychiatric disorder. It's well known to cause hallucinations and delusions, worsening of depression. Um, so I've seen a number of folks that have had either psychotic episodes or severe major depressive bouts with suicidal ideation that have gone on Chantix, so just be very careful of that. Um, there used to be a medicine available. Um, this is just, my brain is full of useless knowledge, so this can be some useless knowledge in your brain. Uh, they're, they're actually, we actually used to have a cannabinoid receptor drug available for psychostimulant um, dependence and abuse uh, in Europe. It was pulled off of the market about 10 years ago and um, everything always comes to market in Europe before it comes to the US by many years um, so it never made it to the US but as we know with 788 there's lots of other cannabinoids the cannabinoids that are going to be able to be utilized so what we've seen is that addiction is not just a, a single entity it's a multifactorial multi, multiple dimensions um, that are influenced by all kinds of things, both genetically, socially, uh, physiologically, uh, psychologically. And although that there is a foundation in neurobiology, neurochemistry, and neuroanatomy, we know that there is genetic roles and social cues and social circumstances that uh, play roles. And just because someone uses a substance, alcohol, doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to become dependent, tolerant, or addicted, okay? I mean, I don't know anybody that really recreationally uses cocaine or methamphetamine. I don't hang around with that group. But, uh, you know, there are some people that, have, that I have seen clinically that say, well, if I'm at a, at a get-together with my old Vietnam buddies, we may, you know, we may use some methamphetamine or whatever, it's the old times. And so there may be some people that recreationally, recreationally use Schedule One drugs, uh, but it's not something that, that uh, I spend a lot of time around. Um, so, summary. We've talked about the areas of the brain, the most important ones, especially 
dopamine as it relates to the reward pathway, the ventral tegmental area, prefrontal cortex, the two big things. Um, dopamine, just remember that's the, the first and the last chemical when it has to deal with uh, rewarding behaviors. Um, and that the drugs of abuse work through not only receptors, but also the transport mechanisms directly and or indirectly on different neuroanatomical areas of the brain. Withdrawal, once somebody's tolerant and or dependent, it will follow abrupt cessation. And so ultimately addiction's the result of changes to your neurochemistry and your neural circuitry, um, both at the cellular and the subcellular levels and the molecular levels of your brain. Questions? No? Okay, we'll go on to the next, because it's not time to pee yet. Uh, and on the, on the, on the uh, screen, yes. I've got all, all, all sets are pulled up, so if you'll just go down to the bottom and, and uh, just hover over the... Aha. Uh -huh. There you go, there it is. Okay. Okay, let's do... The thing I love the most in medicine is sleep medicine. Although I like all the other things I've done in my medical career, if I could do sleep full time all the time, I would do sleep full time all the time. To me it's, it's fabulous and it's actually rewarding. You can effectively change someone's life by dealing with their sleep. Unlike some of the other things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis, just hoping to alleviate some symptoms to improve quality of life, I can truly change someone's life with minimally invasive techniques, oftentimes with sleep, to get a profound benefit in their life. So let's do sleep. So sleep regulation. Sleep has a dual mechanism involved. So we have a homeostatic drive and we have an endogenous um, mechanism involved in sleep. So the homeostatic mechanism is basically the longer I'm awake, the larger the drive is going to get to achieve some sort of sleep. Okay? And this really has to do more about quality. So when we're gonna, and we'll, we'll talk through sleep quality, especially as it pertains to apnea patients, but one thing I often explain to patients is quality versus quantity. So very commonly in sleep-related disorders, patients may be getting what I call always saver brand dish soap sleep. That is, you can use a lot of a junky product and it may suds a little, but it ain't getting you very far and it's not doing a very good job. The goal in treating sleep-related disorders is to get to Dawn dish soap sleep. And that is a little bit goes a long way. So the homeostatic side is really looking at quality over quantity. And this is, again, we're gonna accumulate the desire or the physiological need to sleep as a function of wakefulness. Now the endogenous side is looking at more of a quantity. So the endogenous side is where we're looking at our 24 hour clock. It's driven by melatonin and more specifically core body temperature. So you're gonna see a theme in here that the nadir of core body temperature is very important in how we entrain our sleep cycle along with light entrainment as well. So we'll start with insomnia, we'll do apneas, then we'll do circadian rhythm disorders in a, in a separate slide deck. Insomnia can really be broken up into a ton of different categories. You could have sleep onset insomnia, sleep maintenance insomnia, 
early morning awakening with the inability to return to sleep. You can have mixed onset and maintenance. You can have um, uh, a, a number of factors that will impair your ability to get to sleep and or stay asleep. Um, so when you're doing the evaluation on someone who comes in and complains of, I can't sleep, that's not as easy as, here's a sleep aid. You've really got to figure out every single one of these things right here to tailor your assessment, your diagnosis, and your treatment. Because everybody that says, I have insomnia, doesn't need a sleep aid. Most important thing with insomnia is that number one, we need to evaluate their sleep hygiene. We want them to, we want to look at at least a two week sleep diary. When you go into bed, when you get up, what kind of substances are you ingesting prior to bed? What are you doing throughout the day? What is your medication list? look like? How much caffeine are you taking in? When is your last meal? When are you exercising, if you're exercising at all? So sleep hygiene, very, very important. Do you sleep with a TV in your room? The bed should be for the three S's, and what are those? Why did sex come first? <laughs> sleep, sickness, and sex, right? <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. Because I learned that in psychology. Okay, yes. Like, you, only, you don't study in bed, you don't eat Right, sleep, sleep, sickness, and sex. Those are the only three things that should happen in bed. So if you've got a TV in your room, take it out. And I'm going to explain as to why in a few minutes. So evaluating sleep hygiene, very, very important. And that's a lot of questions. So if you think that I've got a 15-minute visit with a patient that comes in complaining of insomnia, how long is that going to take? Now I've got to screen them for... Depression and anxiety. Why? Mood disorders, it's very common. Early morning awakening with complete inability to get to return to sleep. Somebody comes in and tells you, I wake up at 3 a.m. every morning. I typically go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I get up at 3 a.m. I can't go back to sleep no matter what I do. You better screen them for a mood disorder. That's almost pathognomonic textbook for somebody who's got a mood disorder. Very, very, very common. Or they're a type A personality and it's anxiety driven. But screen for mood disorder. So now your 15 minute visit, mm, how am I getting through this? Well now I've got to look at what are their other chronic medical conditions. Do they have COPD and emphysema? Do they have nocturnal hypoxemia? Could they have an apnea? Could it be an obstructive or a central related apnea? Do they have hypertension? Are they on a beta blocker? Does that make them sleepy during the day? Are they napping a bunch during the daytime so they then can't go to sleep at nighttime? Are they on Accutane as a kid? And now their sleep cycle is all screwed up because they're on Accutane. Dr. Britton, most, most of you will never see Accutane at all in your, but from anybody that's been in medicine or on the pharmacy side and has seen Accutane, very, very effective in the treatment of, of acne, but it will screw up a kid's sleep cycle. And so if you've got a child that mom or dad brings in and they've got problems with sleep, you better be asking them about acne treatment and it oftentimes gets overlooked. You were going to say something, Dr. Bill? No, it's just a, a drug that has a pervasive set of side effects, and that's one of them, but all kinds of behavior changes and, mm -hmm. and multiples. Yes, multiples. yes. You'll, you'll get to that later. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're looking at why is heart failure so important, and I'll talk about that in apnea, but heart failure patients are at greater risk of central sleep apnea. So you're also looking at are they, do they have some sort of neurocognitive decline? Are we looking at a dementia patient that's starting to have some sort of sundowning at night? And then you, you also have to, to uh, start looking at, okay, is their pain disrupting their sleep? So you're, you're now, your 15 minute visit, we're having to do sleep hygiene, screen for psychiatric conditions, we're having to look at all of their medical conditions. Oh, by the way, has there anything in your social history recently changed? What's happened? You know, have we had a recent death in the family? Have you had to recently relocate? You recently lost your job? I've not slept in two nights, can you tell? I got rear-ended on Wednesday night, by or Wednesday morning going to work by some lady on her cell phone. Have I been able to sleep for two nights? Not really, why? Because I've been thinking about that, but number two, because my back is killing me. So, you've got to know what are the acute stressors that are going on. There could be something going on socially. 
I've got an 18 year old that just graduated high school. She's getting ready to go to college. I got to figure out how am I going to pay for that? And I got a kid leaving the house. And although you guys were glad to leave the house, I'm scared to death for my 18 year old to leave the house. So, you know, there are things that are going on that work that will all disrupt our, our sleep. Well, so now our 15 minute visit and evaluating, hey, I can't sleep, PA Smith. Oh man, I gotta do circadian rhythm disorders? What in the world is that? I got a whole slideshow on just circadian rhythm abnormalities because these people are gonna present themselves and you're gonna think, grandma that says that I have insomnia and I wake up in the middle of the night and can't sleep and you figure out that she's going to bed at 6 p.m. So when she wakes up at 2 a.m., that's because she's gone to bed at 6 a.m., not because she's got insomnia and needs Ativan at nighttime. Don't fall into that trap. So you're going to have to screen for circadian rhythm abnormalities. Then we've got to look at medications that are tied to these other medical conditions. Are they an asthmatic and are they using a nebulizer right before bed and now they can't sleep because of the, the, the treatment with the bronchodilator? Are they taking their fentermine because they've got a normal body mass index but, but, but they're vain and so they go see the local hormone doctor and get a bunch of fentermine and they're taking that all day long and now they can't sleep and I need a sleep aid now? I can tell you I see this so commonly that people who are on stimulants during the day but complain they've got anxiety and want benzodiazepines during the day and then want a sleep aid and they're, all they're doing is chasing side effects uh, from the different medications. Are they on beta blockers? Beta blockers can be profoundly sedating to some people, they can also cause mood disruption. So patients who are on beta blockers are at greater risk of developing mood disorders. They oftentimes can, can feel or, or appear to be depressed. Or, uh, we also got to look at one that's not over here is thyroid disorders. Thyroid disorders can affect the way that we sleep. And then we got to look at other primary sleep disorders. We got to rule out apnea. We got to look at periodic limb movement disorder. We got to look at restless leg. So do you think you can get this done in a 15 minute office visit better figure out how because the the one of the biggest complaints that patients come that present with to their gynecologist their primary care provider I can't sleep I got insomnia so that's a very important slide okay sleep onset maintenance mix early morning awakening with inability to return to sleep sleep onset insomnia Oftentimes, what you most importantly have to review is a lot of the sleep hygiene. What are you doing before bed as to why you can't go to sleep? What medicines are you taking? When are you exercising? Your caffeine intake? Those kinds of things oftentimes affect sleep onset insomnia. With those things, you're really just educating and changing sleep hygiene. If we look at all of the data that's available on the treatment of insomnia, Medication is not the way to go. All of the data will show you that cognitive behavioral therapy is the primary treatment for insomnia. There is not a good cognitive behavioral therapist in the state of Oklahoma when it comes to sleep. I'm just going to be very honest with you. The closest cognitive behavioral therapy center for insomnia is in Colorado Springs, and they do a great job, but it's really expensive. However, the state of Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, did a great study a number of years ago looking at cognitive behavioral therapy done online for insomnia. It's a program that costs $29.95, and I think you've got access for 10 weeks, and you can actually communicate with a sleep physician. They have a whole set of steps that people go through in looking at evaluating and changing their sleep hygiene but it's called CBT for insomniaonline.com and it is an absolutely fabulous uh, method by which to get people who are motivated to treat their insomnia but just the I need a pill people are just going to want to do that and not engage in, in other self-help behaviors those people aren't going to get where they need to be treating their insomnia Pills aren't going to work long term, it may be a temporary crutch to help them while they're working through, but cognitive behavioral therapy is the primary. Sleep maintenance. So I wake up multiple times through the night, difficulty getting to sleep. The big thing that you have to rule out here is periodic limb movement disorder, but more importantly apnea, whether it be central or obstructive apnea, we'll talk through apneas in just a few minutes. Mixed, you can have some folks that complain of uh, sleep onset and sleep maintenance insomnia. This can be because not everybody 
presents with one single thing. They may have a number of uh, sleep hygiene related issues on a number of different medications. They may have apnea as well, and so now you're dealing with onset and maintenance that you're having to look at evaluating the treatment. And then early morning awakening, we talked about that. That's where you need to be for sure screening your mood disorder patients. So cognitive behavioral therapy, primary method of treatment. Otherwise, if we look at pills, tablets, capsules that have been approved for the treatment of sleep, so you have your BZRAs, your benzodiazepine receptor drugs, so that's your Zalapon, your Zolpidem, your Estopaclone, Lunesta, Ambien, Sonata. Tamazepam, which is Restoril, also approved for sleep. None of your other benzodiazepines have been approved for, well, wait, maybe Cerax. Back in the day. I think Cerax was approved. So that's an oldie. I don't know if you'll run into much Cerax used by the time you get it. It's not used much. But Restoril is still used frequently, Tamazepam. So those are all working through the benzodiazepine receptor complex. And they're basically overriding, it's just an on-off switch. They're just basically flooding to, to, to flip the switch off. They all have their potential side effects. Benzodiazepines have the potential for suppressing the respiratory drive at the reticular activating system. The other benzodiazepine receptor drugs, Ambien more so than Lunesta, has been shown in post-marketing data to have a greater propensity for next day impairment and amnesia for nighttime events. Please keep in the back of your mind, in 2013, the FDA put a gender-specific warning on Zolpidem. It's one of the few drugs that we have that has a gender-specific warning by the FDA. The FDA has placed maximum dosage limits on Zolpidem for female patients at five milligrams of the immediate release or 6.25 milligrams of the controlled release because of a greater propensity of next day impairment and amnesia for nighttime events. If a patient tells you that they have had amnesia for nighttime events, Ambien needs to be discontinued immediately and never used again. Because the probability of them escalating the types of events that they use and have amnesia for or that they engage in, and the amnesia for that has the potential to grow over time. So it may be initially that they can't figure out how the bread got on the counter and the, and the, and the doors were open to the refrigerator because they're sleep eating. I have seen patients who have sleep driven. I had one particular patient that was out of town um, who had been on Ambien for quite some time and was in the Orlando area for a business meeting. And she hadn't been sleeping well because she'd been there in a funny hotel, you know, for several nights. She didn't routinely take Ambien when she traveled because what she did not tell us ever before was that she had had amnesia for nighttime events, but thought this has only happened a couple of times, so no big deal. But she would travel with the Ambien. She'd been there several days decided, I'm not sleeping well, I've got to get up really early the next day to fly home and I don't want to miss my flight and I don't want to stay up all night and then accidentally fall asleep. So she took Ambien. She did not remember packing her suitcase, taking it downstairs to the lobby, getting into the car. She drove 400 miles in the wrong direction until the car ran out of gas and was woken up on the side of the road by a Florida State Highway Patrol. She had no recollection of any of those events. So amnesia for nighttime events is real, and I've seen it in a large number of cases, so just be careful of that. Orexin receptor antagonists. We finally have this drug available. It's a medicine called Belsamra, or its chemical name is Suvorexant. Orexin, I could spend I have an entire two-hour presentation on orexin. So if we look at, um, and we don't even get, is somebody going over narcolepsy, Dr. Britton? Did y'all did did do narcolepsy? No, no. Yeah. Uh, well, we might have to hit on that just a tad. Orexin, or also known as hypocretin, is a peptide complex that is found in the spinal cord and in the brain or in the spinal canal and in the brain so there are um, a, a, a humans have been found to have narcolepsy and cataplexy there's also a breed of doberman that has been found and studied because of their narcolepsy and cataplexy and there are cataplectic goats 
So we have information that we've done studies on looking at animal data to try to figure out why. So cataplexy is, is an abrupt reduction of muscular tone in the presence of a, an emotionally laden event. So all of the Hollywood drama is somebody gets scared and falls over and snores and that's not true. It doesn't work that way. Actually, if we look at the data, it's a laughter event that more commonly will cause cataplexy than a scared event. So a question that you want to ask patients who present with excessive sleepiness is, do they ever feel very fatigued or have muscle weakness after someone tells them a joke? Do they need to go sit down or sit up against the wall or something like that? Those are actually fairly classic signs of cataplexy. You're not going to really see cataplectic patients on a routine basis that just fall over and go to that, that's just not a common presentation like you would see in Hollywood. But how do we bring this to our recs? And European um, researchers as well as researchers in the United States were trying to figure out what is it that goes on with cataplexy and narcolepsy patients. And so they were studying the animals and they were studying this, uh, the, the breed of Doberman and both researchers almost simultaneously found this peptide complex. One group of researchers called it orexin. One group of researchers called it hypocretin. It's the same thing. But, and it can be interchanged depending on who you're listening to, orexin or hypocretin. The drug itself is listed as an orexin drug. But what we found was that narcolepsy patients, especially those that have cataplexy, have a deficiency in orexin. So then the thought was is that if we can stimulate the orexin receptors, if we can agonize it, we can keep someone awake. And if we can antagonize it, we can make them go to sleep. Because believe it or not, orexin is the handle to the umbrella. So you have orexin is the only chemical in the brain that will interact with every other wake promoting chemical, every other wake promoting neuroanatomical structure and every other weight promoting area of the brain, orexin is the only one that will project to every one of those and interact with serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, GABA, all of them. So what we tried to figure out was is if we stimulate narcolepsy patients with an orexin drug, we can keep them awake. The problem is you cause a lot of other side effects in other areas of the brain and other physiological mechanisms. So then it was easier to antagonize orexin and use it as a sleep aid. And so that drug finally came out, I think it's been out about four or five years, maybe that long. It's called Belsomra, um, but it's a receptor or orexin receptor antagonist. We talked about benzodiazepines, the melatonergic system. Okay, what time is it? Three. Do y'all need to go to the bathroom? Y'all need a break, stand up, stretch, or keep going? Let's let's talk through the melatonin system and then we'll take a break. So, um, your, your when we talked about the homeostatic versus the endogenous in the very beginning. So your endogenous melatonergic system is absolutely vital for your regulation of your 24-hour sleep cycle. So light enters the eye and activates the retina. The retina sends a direct connection to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus has two main parts. One part that winds the 24-hour clock and one part that sends a projection to the pineal gland. If light is activating the retina, which activates the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus sends an antagonistic signal to the pineal gland saying do not secrete melatonin. Okay? Does that make sense? Blue wavelength light is what activates the retina. Sunlight is basically blue wavelength light. We are getting technologically advanced enough that the computers in front of you, smartphones, iPads, televisions are getting closer and closer to emitting blue wavelength type light. So we are activating the retina at inappropriate times, 
consistently through the day and the nighttime. So if we have telephones in our hand when we're laying in bed at night, if we're watching TV, if we're utilizing our computer, if we're reading on our iPad or tablet or whatever it may be, even your Apple Watch, you're starting to get close enough to blue wavelength light that we are now confusing the retina feedback on the suprachiasmatic nucleus to the pineal gland to take no melatonin production. Now as it gets darker at night or as it gets moves more towards the evening, we have less interaction with the retina so that there's not as much input on the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So we remove that antagonistic feedback on the pineal. So the pineal is now allowed to secrete melatonin, which has a direct feedback to the suprachiasmatic nucleus to wind the 24 hour clock. You see how it's a big loop, okay? As the brain ages, we produce less melatonin. Melatonin supplementation can be appropriate in the treatment of insomnia, but it has to be given at appropriate times. Melatonin needs to be given about two hours prior to desired sleep time because that's how long it takes the system to prime and work itself. Melatonin also does not work like an on-off switch like benzodiazepine drugs are or BZRAs do. It doesn't work like that. It's more of a dimmer switch to then allow the brain to turn itself off appropriately. So melatonin supplementation over the counter comes in a couple of different forms. One is animal based, so they take pineal glands from animals and grind them up, and you can take those, or plant based. So they're actually uh, melatonin that can be manufactured from certain plants. You want to be careful if you're either taking it yourself or recommending melatonin supplementation. If somebody is using an animal based, it's not a well regulated area of the supplement industry, so there are other hormones that can be involved in that, so we can see other hormonal disruption. You should also not suggest melatonin supplementation in children or those under the age of 18 because melatonin supplementation can increase prolactin levels. So what does hyperprolactinemia do? Gynecomastia, galacteria, amenorrhea. Okay, so we know if we supplement uh, children, we're at greater risk of doing those things, but also if you're, if you're um, supplementing melatonin in an adult patient, then you need to be A, giving them those warnings, and B, you need to be asking those questions, even though they may seem uncomfortable or seem kind of dumb to ask. If you're, if you're supplementing melatonin, you need to let those patients be aware and you need to ask them those questions. And then there are off-label insomnia treatments most commonly prescribed off-label drug for insomnia in the U.S. is not gonna prescribed uh, trazodone. trazodone, the old Desiree. Um So trazodone is, you see other tricyclic antidepressants used, so amitriptyline is, is used. You see uh, certain um, other uh, psychotropic drugs like Rimeron, which is a tetracyclic, like uh, trazodone is a, is a tetracyclic as well. Um, you can see things like um, uh, quetiapine, which is Seroquel, used for bipolar disorder and for schizophrenia. Under 300 milligrams um, of quetiapine is really just a potent antihistamine. It's really not doing anything for mood stabilization, except causing weight gain and sedation. And so quetiapine is often used off-label. You'll see other antihistamines, hydroxyzine as a prescription antihistamine can be sometimes seen uh, as an anxiety reducer or a, a sleep aid. Um, you can see muscle relaxants used at night. So cyclobenzaprine is also a tricyclic. So it can have some mood interaction as well as be fairly sedating. Um, tizanidine, which is an alpha blocker um, as a muscle relaxant. Um, it has some cardiovascular side effects as well, prostate side effects bladder side effects, but also can be sedating and sometimes used off-label. Let's take a break here. This will be a good chance to before we start apnea.